morning, everyone. Thank you for attending the, uh, this breakout session. Um, we're going to focus on ensuring housing protections uh, for survivors of domestic violence. My name is Shahida Wilkes. I am a housing investigator for uh, the PHRC. And housing is a crucial component to the health and well-being of the residents of Pennsylvania. The PA Human Relations Commission has a vested interest in making sure that all individuals and families in the Commonwealth can enjoy the benefits of living in a neighborhood of their choice, in a safe, in a home that is safe and affordable, and that they do not encounter discrimination in obtaining or maintaining their housing. Today's panel of subject matter experts will answer questions, sharing their knowledge and experience relating to fair and equitable housing for individuals surviving domestic violence. Our panelists are Megan Comfort Hammond. Megan? Uh, Megan is the executive director of the Fair Housing Partnership of Greater Pittsburgh. Megan has 13 years of experience at FHP. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Architecture from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, we have Rachel Shepard. Rachel is the Executive Director of the Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations, the City Civil Rights Enforcement Agency. As a third generation City of Pittsburgh employee, Rachel has a deep-seated commitment to serve in her community. We have J.R. Wolfmeyer. Upon completing his bachelor's degree at Millersville University, J.R. began his career in victim services with the District Attorney's Office of York County, PA, where he worked as a victim witness coordinator in a general courtroom. He was also assigned to the indirect criminal contempt PFA violation courtroom where he first began to work professionally with victims of domestic violence. J.R. currently works for the PA Board of Probation and Parole in the Office of the Victim uh, Advocate, where he manages the Address <coughs> Confidentiality Program. We have Rhonda Fleming. Rhonda is the Chief of Prevention, Intervention, and Outreach at Women's Center and Shelter of Greater Pittsburgh a leader in providing safety, shelter, support, and guidance to all survivors of domestic violence. And last but not least, we have Juliette Chara. Juliette is the founder and executive director of the Pride Ministry, a local nonprofit that helps women leaving domestic violence situations. Her passion to help broken women fall flows from the pain of her own past. She is a, is a survivor of domestic violence, homelessness, and attempted suicide. So my opening question is a question for all the panelists, so each of you will have a chance to answer this opening question. Can you briefly tell us about your organization, what your organization does, and how you work with survivors of domestic violence? Okay, uh, the Office of Victim Advocate, in short, is, we are responsible for advocating for the collective and individual rights of victims across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Can you get closer to your microphone? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot hear you. Hi, so my name's JR, and we are responsible at OBA for the collective and individual rights of all crime victims in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, so if your, if your offender ends up in state prison on state parole or on state probation, we serve as victim services for the Department of Corrections and the Pennsylvania Board of Probation Parole. So the Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations is the official civil rights enforcement agency for the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, we investigate complaints of discrimination as well as provide education and outreach to um, the people of Pittsburgh so they're aware of their rights and responsibilities under the law. Um, and that includes survivors of domestic violence, which were added as protected classes um, and Good morning, I'm Rhonda Fleming. <clears throat> As introduced in the Homeless Center and Shelter, we have a plethora of services for victims of 
survivors of intimate partner violence, which include obviously our shelter, and I say that obviously because it is the one we hear most about. We also have non-residential services at Women's Center Shelter, Children's Advocacy Program, Education and Outreach. We have a program that is for women who are relocating. We help them with housing. That's pretty obvious for this one today. So we help them with housing. And again, there's many other services that we have. And I want, would be remiss if I said, because of our name, you think it's only women. We do serve male victims of intimate partner violence and members of the LGBTQ plus community who are survivors of the intimate partner violence as well. Thank you. Good morning. At Thrive, um, we help victims of domestic violence um, after they have left the abuse. We do also serve men as well, but we don't get as many of those, obviously. Um, but what we're doing is trying to help them to establish a safe and secure home for them and their children. Um, and along with that, we do things like support groups, Bible studies, mentoring, girls' nights, trying to help them break the cycle of violence that so many get stuck in. Um, I also serve as the chair of the board for the Adams Rescue Mission, who is represented here today as well. And we have a program there where we have a men's shelter on site at the mission, and then we have a family shelter in downtown Gettysburg serving the Adams County community um, and doing more and growing in the next year and hoping to provide some transitional housing. So. I'm the executive director of the Fair Housing Partnership for Greater Pittsburgh. We're an advocacy and investigative agency where we investigate and advocate on behalf of survivors of domestic violence um, under federal and city law in order to ensure the pragmatic impact on the ground that the laws are being enforced and that particularly that survivors are able to flee uh, residential situations in which they are facing abuse uh, or to better secure their homes in order to prevent an abuser from having access to their homes. Uh, and we're the investigative agency for advocating on their behalf to ensure that those laws are being enacted uh, in the actual property throughout the city of Western Pennsylvania <coughs> and areas in Pennsylvania that don't have access to their housing organizations. Thank you all. So let's just jump yeah. right into the questions here. Do you guys want to? No, uh, but as the TC's uh, pan panelists have, um, yeah. Rhonda Fleming, how do you define domestic violence? So I define domestic violence, what I always have called my $20 definition because it's really long, and then you can break it down. I say it's an ongoing pattern of behavior, and I always stop right there because we have to look at the word ongoing. It is with intention, it is purposed and it follows a method. So it's ongoing pattern of behavior that the person who uses violence, let me put a pause right there, right there. We always say the abuser, and now the language is changing to persons who uses violence. But I'm gonna be honest with you, when I'm speaking, that's a lot of words to say. So I will say abuser with all due respect. An ongoing pattern of behavior that the abuser uses to force, coerce, and manipulate the victim survivor for what the abuser wants. This is without regards for that person's rights, health, or safety. Over time, the abuse will increase, it will lower self-esteem, it will become more dangerous, and in the end, abuse takes away choice. It's all about power and control that the person who uses violence chooses to set up in his or her or their way. Thank you. What are the different forms of domestic violence and what specific form of domestic violence is prevalent? You know, we hear most about, thank you, we hear most about physical violence. We see it in movies, it's on commercials, it's in music, you know, so it's what we hear and know most about. I would never want to minimize physical violence because it is also what takes away lives. Uh, it takes away lives physically, we do the homicide or murder, or murder, or homicide murder. Um, but it also takes away life, as I said in the definition, that it removes choice. So just a person's being, their emotional being, their spiritual being, just who they are, it takes that away from them as well. So I don't want to minimize physical violence at all. 
Also, though, at this time, I also want to bring up that financial abuse is really a major problem, particularly when we're looking at housing. It is so difficult for victims of um, intimate partner violence to maintain employment. It can be really hard to work if you're living with someone using power and control who doesn't let you or allow you to work, regardless of your degree, your experience, your talents. You're just not allowed. You're not permitted to work. So therefore, it can be really difficult even when you do leave this situation um, and you need to start over or start out on your own because of the financial abuse that you've been, um, that you have suffered may make it difficult again to get employment. So I would definitely want to talk about the financial abuse, mental, emotional, psychological abuse, all of the other types of abuse that overlap because you cannot have one type without the other. They all overlap together. There's no way that I'm going to have emotional abuse and not have something else going on in my life. There's no way that you can slap me and it not affect me uh, mentally and psychologically. And everybody, not everybody, I'm sorry. Oftentimes we want to say, well, oh, isn't mental and psychological the same thing? They are very similar. <clears throat> and again, it's real hard. It's that little thin line. How do you separate them? And mental abuse affects the way a person thinks, obviously. You know, so I'm like, and I, it happens in all age groups. So I'm a 17 year old, I'm a senior, I'm excited, I'm ready to go to school. I come downstairs, head out the door, and remember, oh, he hates when I wear these pants. I have to go change. So that's my mental. I, I can't do anything. I can't get dressed. I can't leave the house. I can't decide what to cook. I can't change the baby cycle. And that this goes on and on, and I have to constantly think. And that's where, when you think of the word victim survivor, that's how one is surviving, because I have to constantly think, not that I can ever do anything right, because the person who uses fire control gets to change the rules every time I do what they wanted me to do the last time, they change the rules this time. However, I do have to practice my thinking, so that's the mental. Psychological abuse happens when it becomes so, so much so that the victim survivor now believes everything that the person who uses power and control tells them. You know, so in, in other words, I have the mental, I have to constantly affect me, I have to constantly think about it. Psychological is I now see myself as that person defines me. So I'm going to stay with the teenage, I don't know I'm telling teenagers this morning, I'm going to stay with the teenage example. I'm 15, 10th grade, really good, oh, this is a good time, thing that W. NBA draft, this is a good example. But I am um, 15, I'm getting ready to try out for the basketball team, and my partner tells me, you know you're not really good, right? Um, you know why you're really gonna try out, you know? And I was so excited to tell my partner, I'm trying out for the hoop team tomorrow. Come come over and let, you know, let's do a little bit of practicing, right? But then they tear me down, my self-esteem is deplored already from being in this relationship. They tear me down, and I go to school the next day, and I find my best friend, and I tell her, you know what, I changed my mind. I it's gonna take up too much time, I really wanna get a job. And I tell her everything except my abusive partner is not allowing me to try out for this hoop team. <laughs> and now I really believe, and I say to, to my best friend, you're good, you got a great three-pointer, but I'm not really that good, so I'm, I'm not gonna try out. You know, that's the psychological. I now believe I'm not that good at basketball, so I'm not going to try out. So that's uh, another form that we really have to pay attention to. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bill, I mean, connecting homelessness to domestic violence. According to the National Alliance to End Homelessness, research consistently shows that high number of people experiencing homelessness homelessness have also survived domestic violence. What are some of the biggest challenges people, people face when they are displaced from them, their homes due to domestic violence? Yes, <laughs> uh, biggest challenge, I'm going to go back to what we were just saying, though, the financial abuse. Getting a job, maintaining employment, uh, is definitely an obstacle. You know, and there's things that get written down in records that carry on and people get to see them. So maybe there was addiction. Maybe the addiction may have been caused, I'm not gonna say that's 100%, but may have been caused because the person who uses violence 
got the uh, victim survivor book torn drugs, right? So maybe there's something in the records that shows instability. There may be something around the, you know, they dreaded credit report. Their credit report, so they have bad credit or no credit. You know, both of those could work against the person as well. So those are obstacles as well to, um, uh, to the homeless problem for people who are surviving into the part of violence. Thank you. I have one more question for you. <laughs> Having a safe place to live is essential for domestic violence survivors who want to leave their abuser. In your professional opinion, are there correlations between being denied housing or being evicted when it comes to people who are experiencing domestic violence? And also please share the stereotypes of domestic violence situations that landlords believe when renting to survivors of domestic violence. I'm sorry, can you repeat? Part of the first. Okay. Yeah, I got the uh, end of it, the stereotypes, and before that is. Uh, to share the stereotypes of domestic violence situations that landlords believe when renting to survivors of domestic violence. Okay, so, some of the stereotypes is it, uh, stereotypes often start with these people or those people. So that's one of the things that begins with. So, some of the thoughts around victim survivors of intimate partner violence families who live with domestic violence that those people cause problems. Those people don't pay their rent. Those people will not keep up my property. So that is some of the stereotypes that come along with um, intimate partner violence that makes it really difficult for someone to get the, um, to get housing and maintain housing. Um, I'm still forgetting something I wanted to say. Um, I'm sorry. The first part of that. The second part was the stereotypes, the first correlations between homelessness and being denied. And being denied. Okay. So, yeah, again, it goes back to, thank you, it also goes back to the addiction. It goes back to so many things get looked at when you're going for housing. I can tell you, I was once a victim of housing discrimination. I was too young to do anything about it. So many things get looked at when you're going for housing that uh, can impact a uh, and particularly a private landlord's opinion of t as to whether they will rent to you or not. You know, we have, and someone else is probably going to speak more about the Barbara Act that protects victims, and says, uh, victims of domestic violence that you do have to rent to them. You cannot put them out. However, um, and we know someone's going to mention, I think, in the city of Pittsburgh, what we're working on as well in the city of Pittsburgh for the protection of rights. So that's there, but with private landlords, sometimes you, the person is put out before any of that comes to play. You don't, you're out, you're homeless. You know, you may have to go through, you can go to court, you can fight it, but in the meantime, you're homeless, you don't have anywhere to live. And that again is because of the stereotypes I started out with. You know, these people cause trouble, they don't pay their rent. They have children, they have a lot of children. I let them move in, they're going to let somebody else move in. Those are all the kinds of things that we hear. And the other thing that's real sad is um, around racial discrimination, it gets a part of that as well. You know, so we don't want them living in our neighborhood. Or oftentimes, now, just to be transparent, oftentimes uh, black brown uh, families are referred to some of the more deplorable homes. Some of the stories we heard, there's a, um, somebody who got placed and there was a mice infestation. You know, somebody who got placed and there was a roach infestation. So when the um, advocate goes out for the home visit and look, it's like, okay, you really can't live here. You know, so they're put in some horrible hot places to live and of course then when they move out, let's go back to the whole thing that I was saying. Now we have to start over. There's the application fee for it to apply. Sometimes it's $150 to apply, you know, for the application, then you get denied. But that $150 is not refundable. So the um, that goes. Uh, that's a part of it that makes it difficult as well, you know. And the stereotypes that just say um, domestic violence is a problem, but it's somebody else's problem, not mine. I think that's what makes it so also so difficult to get housing and to maintain housing, stable housing. Thank you so much for sharing. So we're going to move on to um, Ms. Rachel Shepard from the Pittsburgh Commission of Human Relations. First question I have is, what percentage of housing complaints filed with the city commission are domestic violence related? So it is a very small percentage. We don't see the domestic violence protected class very often with our intakes or even coming to fruition with a full complaint and an investigation. 
You know, there's this hierarchy of need that people who are in a domestic violence situation have, and they are not often thinking, oh, let me, let me try to challenge this discriminatory behavior in addition to trying to find housing and get financial stability and get my kids transitioned and, 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 and. So it is a very, very small per, uh, percentage. I don't even have you know, a solid case off the top of my head. We do have a number of sex-based claims that maybe could be domestic violence, but they don't uh, you know, acknowledge that as a protection when they come to file with us, and we don't really push people um, to do that. But yeah, it's, it's very small. We would encourage people to come to us more frequently, though, because not only do we have this protection in the city code to support survivors of domestic violence when they're fleeing their abuser, um, when they are experiencing maybe long-term effects of rental where they have additional fees that they have to pay now because they ended a lease early, et cetera. Um, and we can help work, work through that for them. So, and, and in the process, we are able to educate the landlords in a way that will keep them from doing it to someone else. Thank you. Um, second question I have for you, um, Rachel. What are the most common reasons you see for the fouling of these domestic violence related complaints? So the ones that we have seen are typically, again, they, they will come to us as an inquiry, they'll come to us and say, okay, is this actually discrimination? And then sometimes they'll choose not to file. Um, but the one that comes to mind is a, um, there was additional fees, uh, past due rent, that the landlord was taking the um, survivor to court and they were trying to fight that uh, in court to make sure that they were not going to have to pay all of that. Uh, and again, like that's something that we can help protect from that is protected under the city code that the landlords are, it's discriminatory to charge additional fees for a survivor of domestic violence when they're trying to flee their, um, their situation. So that would probably be the number one. And again, because that's something that happens pretty far after the fact where you can finally get your bearings and be able to address that like debt that you're now in and the, the obligation that you have. Um, so that's when they will come to us because they have already taken care of their most um, dire needs. Thank you. And what is the protocol when the city commission receives a domestic violence housing complaint? So we handle it uh, just a little bit differently than we would with a normal inquiry only because we want to be able to assess for those immediate needs that a person may have. So anytime anyone contacts us, you can contact us by phone, in person, on our um, online portal, via email, and we have all of our staff are trained to you know, receive those inquiries and make sure that it's jurisdictional. And for us, that means that it happened within the city of Pittsburgh limits, the physical limits of the city, um, within the last 365 days, and that it is based on some kind of protected class covered by the city code. So with the domestic violence, if someone calls and identifies that as a protection, the first thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is identify, okay, are you fleeing this situation right now? What other supports do you need? Because we have an extensive list of resources that we use to refer people out. Um, you know, the Women's Center and Shelter is a, a strong partner. We work with Standing Firm and Rent Help Pittsburgh. Um, the Just Mediation Pittsburgh, if they're experiencing an eviction and they may benefit from those eviction mediation services. Uh, so we wanna make sure that they're getting those things taken care of first. And if it is something that's more of an immediate need, I have my staff escalate it to either our deputy director or myself so that we can make sure that we are paying attention to this, that we are kind of moving this to the front of the line so that we can ensure that the discrimination is not causing them additional harm in in their experience of fleeing their abuser. Thank you. Last question. A troubling, a troubling economy picture could target all Pennsylvanians. His birth job, job market is working on a recovery from the losses endured, endured in 2020. How does the economy affect domestic violence? So I think Rhonda already spoke to this a lot, um, talking about the debt that can accumulate, uh, the poor credit scores. Um, but honestly, you, if you think about 2020 and what we all had to go through with the COVID pandemic, people were 
contained in their homes with people for very long periods of time without the ability to kind of flee to get anywhere. I mean, we weren't even permitted to go to the grocery store, you know, it was it was very restrictive. So that can add tension to an already volatile situation for someone who's experiencing domestic violence. So that in itself was something to consider. But there's also that level of financial dependency that people have, you know, if someone is controlling the money, they're controlling your every move, they control what, what money you can spend and when. Um, it maybe the vehicle is only in their name. So having these financial restrictions is always going to be a problem for people experiencing domestic violence. And now with the economic downturn, with the, with the hardship that people are facing, with just the cost of living increasing, it can be even more difficult for people to escape their situation, to move forward, because they need that additional support. Um, and that's why we like to refer to our resources and our partners, because they have that expertise, they have those resources that they can help distribute to the people that really need them so that they can find the way to move forward, whether that's through rental assistance or you know something under the VAWA protections. We want to make sure that they have what they need. Um, so yeah, and the, the other thing that I'll mention is, um, again, something that Rhonda had stated, but we have uh, the employment discrimination protection for survivors of domestic violence in the Pittsburgh area as well. Um, that was created in 2021 in partnership with Standing Firm. Uh, and we don't see, again, this is another one of those situations where we do not see filings on domestic violence, but we know that it's happening. So we are about to take uh, a, a additional steps for outreach for people so that they're aware that this protection exists. Um, but the employment protection will keep people from, you know, if you're, if you're afraid to sit at a front desk, because you're aware that your abuser may just walk in the front door and come after you. It's an accommodation that you can request to be moved to a different space. If you um, are looking for employment and you know you happen to mention that you're fleeing domestic violence, maybe you don't have a, a firm address yet uh, for where you're going to be next, a permanent address, and they deny you the job because they said, we're not going to deal with you. We don't want to bring this drama in here then that is an additional problem. So in addition to the housing protections where people who are fleeing have that option to have their locks changed and to be able to move forward without those additional fees hanging over their heads, we have the employment protections so that if an employer is starting to get involved in this or they're not as responsive as they should be to someone who is struggling and could use just a little bit of extra support, then we can take those claims as well. Thank you so much, Rachel. What resources does the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania offer to address the housing needs of victims of domestic violence? I'm sorry to say very few. Um, at the state level, uh, we have victims' compensation that can, re re that can reimburse for relocation should you be able to justify your, your relocation as a need due to your victimization. Um, but the caps on that are very small. I haven't done a VCAP claim since I was at the county level, but back then it was about 1500 bucks total. And my memory is that relocation is a lot more expensive than 1500 bucks. Um, other than that, the other program that, that directly addresses housing for domestic violence victims at the state level that, that we have the availability of is the Address Confidentiality Program. And unfortunately, that doesn't pay for relocation nor give you housing. It only protects your housing once you're there so that you don't end up having to move again in a month when the abuser finds you. So, um, I really hate that question because it's such an unsatisfactory answer. Um, going into victim services, like a lot of you, I'm, I'm a people person, I'm a fixer. And not having a great solution to a problem, just, it's what keeps me awake at night. Um, so, it, I have been saying now for probably about 15 years, if any of my clients or any of you ever strike an independently wealthy, how about a GoFundMe for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault who are fleeing an abusive home? Please help us. Yay! We have agreement. In your experience, JR, how are victims of domestic violence impacted either emotionally, psychologically, and or financially when they are subjected to housing legal proceedings? So, you know, the, 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 
I'm sure Rhonda would agree with me. The primary question I get asked day after day after day is, why don't they just leave? Right? So, why don't they just leave? Well, we're here for one of those big reasons. Where are they going to go? Where can they afford to go? If you were kicked out of your house tomorrow with no money, could you afford to go rent a place? I don't know. So, as a result of that, um, domestic violence victims, when they, when they finally make that decision to flee, one of the biggest hurdles, one of the biggest first hurdles they face is where am I going to go? And that particularly gets more difficult when you have kids, pets. I, I don't want to speak for Rhonda, but I'll speak for myself. In my time of working in domestic violence victim services, 22 years now, almost 23, I've lost at least one client because they went back to get the dog. And trust me, I like my dog better than I like most human beings. And I admit that without shame. But we have to have a way to make sure that housing is not only affordable, but that it's immediate and that it meets the exact needs of our clientele. And that might include messy things like pets and teenagers. So we, we need those things. Because to, to come up with the, the wherewithal to finally move and then to run into that first roadblock, I, I have nowhere to go. I can't afford to go anywhere. The places I can afford, I wouldn't want my kids to live. With, I think probably the more appropriate question that we could ask domestic violence victims is, why did you finally leave? What kind of bravery must have taken for you to go? Thank you. Taylor, based on your experience, can you please highlight the trauma housing displacement has on families experiencing? <coughs> so, I'm going to start off with, with my, own, my own history. You know, when my parents divorced, I was 12 years old. And my entire life was turned upside down in one day. My parents never abused one another that I saw. Might have been some, some mental, some verbal abuse as they were finally splitting up, but I never saw that. But I went from day one, I have a family, to day two, I no longer have a family. So the first thing we have to really recognize is that domestic violence, while it is a violent relationship, is still a relationship. One of the big reasons people don't leave that we really underestimate is love. So the trauma that, that people experience when they leave is first and foremost, you're leaving that, that safe place. You know, I think Hemingway said that we're all looking for that warm, well-lit place, right? And when you have to leave that, the trauma, particularly for children, is incredible. Couple that with moving into a place where you know you wouldn't have moved had it not been for the violence, had it not been for the split up, had it not been for mom leaving. And that trauma just continues to, to build. So what we end up seeing, I think, is that housing is just one of the catalysts that drive a generational trauma. And that, honestly, if, if we don't do something about this, as we've already seen, and Rhonda, I'm sure you've seen it better than I have, because you've got just one or two more years than I have, I think. Um, I, we do see the same families. We, we see the same families come back as victims, and we see the same families come back as, as unfortunately, offenders as well. So in order to break that cycle, I think it's really simple. We have to, uh, I, I believe Rachel mentioned it a, a few moments ago, I want you to think about Maslow's hierarchy for me. We have to meet the, the, the base of that pyramid before we can self-actualize. So we have to make sure that our clients have a warm, well-lit place, plenty of food, a place where they feel belonging. We have to make sure that they feel like they're part of a community. And I think that that starts with housing, right? I think that's why you're all here today. You know, the beautiful part of this is that you're married. We're married in two skill sets. The skill set, the skill set of housing and the skill set of domestic violence, which should never have been separated in the first place. But we're finally coming together, and, and I think that, honestly, good work can come out of this. I think that's why we're all here today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, JR, for enlightening us. Megan, can you tell us about how and why domestic violence is a fair housing issue? So fair housing or housing discrimination at its very core in spirit is about housing choice. We typically think about housing choice and housing discrimination as being denied access. 
what is really the elephant in the room in this discussion is that at the federal and state level, that the protected classes, because a housing discrimination complaint, by definition, has to include a protected class. And survivors of domestic violence is not a protected class. In the city of Pittsburgh, we have fought extraordinarily hard to include survivors of domestic violence as an explicit protected class. And what we've been able to do with federal law in the state of Pennsylvania is that you understand there's two different types, there's two fundamental concepts of housing discrimination under the law. There's treatment, and so I refuse to rent to you because you're a survivor. That's a direct, I refuse to rent. But then there's also something called impact. There's also something called, when we look at a rule, the rule isn't anti-survivors, but the impact of the rule is that it will negatively, disproportionately impact survivors. And so what we've done, and what the city of Pittsburgh has done with the survivor domestic violence as a protected class, is not new, it's not cutting edge, we're not pushing a legal envelope. Because what has happened is that the federal government has modeled this concept under the Violence Against Women, or what's known as VAWA, for years, if not decades at this point. And so what we've done is we've taken VAWA, which applies to federally funded housing providers, to housing authorities, to other third party subsidy providers, and we've applied it to the private market because the need exists, and the need will continue to exist until we create the laws and then enforce those laws to ensure that survivors have equal housing choice within all types of housing, and they have the choice to flee. Thank you so much. Megan, in October 2023, new housing protections for survivors of domestic violence were introduced and enacted in the city of Pittsburgh. What is the background and rationale behind the amendment? So the big push behind that, and we'll talk about this case further, is that there was a predominant case that we took into federal court in recent years. But what made that case so important was that Ashley Butler's case wasn't a one-off or it wasn't a singular incident. It was representative of cases that we've had come into our office before and after Ashley Butler's case. So for example, in the time in which we were pursuing this amendment in the city of Pittsburgh, we had a case at FHP where a survivor had just relocated into a new rental apartment. She just signed a new lease agreement. And the complexity of an abuser includes ongoing relationship entanglements regarding custody and shared children. And so when her abuser came to drop off their child after he had his time with the child, he dropped the child off. There was no issue. And then she reported that later that night, he came back so irate for no reason that she knew. And he beat her door down so severely, it took the door off the hinges. She grabbed her child and they fled to a family member's house. She immediately contacted the landlord that night or the next morning about what had happened. And what happened to her, going through this incredibly traumatic experience, when she thought she was turning over, the landlord gave her a multi-thousand dollar bill, saying that she owed not only for the cost of replacing the door, but she owed if she was leaving the lease, she forfeited her security deposit, and she owed for additional month's rent. And so what I do is the easiest part of an incredibly nuanced discussion. Because what happens is, when we get to the part of advocating on behalf of a fair housing case, is that survivor of domestic violence has a protected class. What that means is, is that a person has had to make the decision to flee. And not everyone is always ready to be there. That's why we need all the agencies on this panel, because I can't do it by myself, but I am ready. Is that once that we have our peer agencies here who have survivors, who have made the decision, who are prepared to, who are wanting to flee, but it's their housing that is causing an obstacle, or their housing is causing an obstacle in any way, either to get into it or to flee from it, that the law is on their side to protect them. 
years and years ago, long before I started this advocacy or addressing city law or state law or federal law and other efforts that we take. One of my early cases was a, a, a woman who was a refugee, I believe from Somalia. And she had come to the States with her husband from a refugee camp. And because of the cultural norms of both their home country and the refugee camp itself, her husband actually was abusive. But she didn't have words for that. That was, that was a cultural norm in her relationship with him. And what had happened was he prevented her from learning English as a form of his domestic violence as a means of controlling the household. And at one point, uh, he, he had a severe temper and he had broken the cabinet tops in the, in the apartment. And at one point, he had her sign paperwork. And what she didn't know until much after the fact, that the paperwork that she signed was divorce papers. And so he divorced her, left her and their children in the apartment, and then left and made a new relationship, a new life, a new family. And the landlord couldn't get a hold of him, but she could get a hold of her. And they charged her thousands and thousands of dollars, not just for the remaining rent, but for the broken countertop. And so we intervened on her behalf and argued with a very large management company, a very large property ownership company, where we're not asking, we're not trying to prevent housing providers from getting the money that they're owed and due. But in situations of domestic violence, the police in which she and him are on the lease, in this case, by barricading the lease, in such a manner as to pursue the damages against him. Because due to the violence, due to the financial abuse, she did not have her own income, she did not have her own job, she did not have access to the English language in which to pursue those things. And he controlled all the finances. So to let her go out of that lease and that financial obligation in order for her to rebuild her life and figure out what comes next for her and to pursue and focus any financial pursuit by bifurcating the lease on her abuser, her husband, her ex, uh, who was also as obligated, arguably, for that lease as she was. She was just more readily available. And in so many of our cases, whether it's domestic violence or other protected classes, the vast majority of our cases were able to settle and conciliate and resolve without going all the way into a court process. And so on these cases that I just mentioned, we resolved them, engage with the landlord, we appreciate landlords who engage with us, who listen, who collaborate, and we were able to get the survivor out of the situation so that, from my point of view, a thousands of dollar bill for damages that they're not responsible for is not a part of their journey of rebuilding their life and their next step after their plan. Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> Referring to the amendments that I mentioned in the previous question, um, how effective are these amendments and are landlords and housing providers willfully complying? It's, it's, it's a combination. And so we're often able to address cases by engaging with the landlord, explaining what the law is, explaining what it is that we're asking for and why. But it's critical that we have the law there to reference. And so right before the city code was, was passed last year, we had a case where a survivor told us, they told us as her advocate story, the story of how he threw the lamp next to her and then grabbed her arm so hard that it bruised. And a very difficult, you can't repeat that, will the police believe you, will, will the court system believe you, can you create a protection from abuse order, or will, will other people believe you that it happened? Well, what she did was she waited until he went to work, then she packed up her belongings, she packed up her kids' belongings, she told us that, she researched all the shelters for survivors in the region, and she fled to the one that was furthest away. And we got a letter from that shelter that what they do, who they serve, and that she qualified for their services. And so when we engaged with that landlord, a very large company, we explained that she needed to be released from her lease or bifurcated so that she was released from her lease in order to allow her to pursue the decision to flee. And that landlord, who the property management was phenomenal and talked to us and collaborated with us, but as a large organization, they still had to get the approval or go ahead from their legal counsel 
housing provider and said we're prepared to file, if we're not able to resolve it successfully, then we do file as having the law there to make sure that there's a way to actually enforce it. We're not asking. It's critical in order to make sure that at the end of the day, we can enforce the law on the books if we're unable to reach an agreement voluntarily with the landlord. So having the law there is a critical part of that negotiation. Thank you. Can you talk about your recent findings from your fair housing case out in federal court regarding domestic violence, the Butler v. Sundar? I know you touched on this a little bit in the previous question and what the impact of that case is. So what that case was and what many of you, if you've ever rented an apartment or if you've served clients who rent apartments and you may understand with local landlords is that in this case, the local landlord was a lawyer himself. And so he was quite convinced that he would be able to prevail against us. And what happens in Pennsylvania, and if I had a magic wand and I could change one thing about the housing market in Pennsylvania, it would be that landlords and tenants are not allowed to negotiate 
it has been informed by your personal experience with domestic violence. Can you share your experience in the housing challenges faced by the survivors that you serve? Sure. Um, so my background, obviously, is I am a survivor of domestic violence. And when I left my abuser with my young son um, in Hanover, Pennsylvania, there was no shelter. There was nowhere to go. And so we lived in our car. And I worked three jobs and saved up enough money to finally get my first apartment. Um, not an easy process, but very much the reality for most victims that I see. Unfortunately, when you leave, there's just not enough places to go. The shelters are full. Um, and so even the shelters that are out there, you're constantly referring, but there's just not enough space for everybody. Um, and so we find that a lot of our victims do stay in the abuse. Um, if they try to leave and they have nowhere to go, then the abusers are often threatening to call children and youth if you're gonna be homeless with your child. It's a very real reality that your children could be taken from you. Um, and so we just, we're seeing more and more um, clients that even if they get a HUD voucher or a Section 8 voucher, whatever you want to call it, that um, there's not enough housing. Um, Adams County with the Adams Rescue Mission, we're seeing a lot of that, where they're getting the vouchers, but there's no apartments available. There's just such a lack in our area of the state anyway, and I'm assuming it's that way across the state. Um, but it's, it's also landlords, and a big one that I felt like I see is that um, landlords often discriminate too because they're worried that the abuser will show up there. We've heard that a lot from our girls. If they have to be honest that they're in a domestic violence situation, the landlords do not always like that. Um, and so for us, it's you know trying to get the girls safe using the address confidentiality program, that kind of thing. But it's hard when there's no affordable housing out there. And in our area, affordable, I don't know what it is here, you're talking $1,600 a month for rent for a tiny apartment plus utilities. And, and our, our um, economy in our area, you're, you're lucky if you're making 10 bucks an hour. How do, you, how do you afford that? And so then on top of that, you have the other main problem I feel like with housing and jobs is childcare. Um, there's just not enough help with childcare. And in your county, um, we, you know, you get on the list for, for childcare help, but you have to be working the entire time you're on the list or you get taken off the list. So how do you find childcare if you can't afford it? And it's just, it's a ever evolving, um, Door that, that our, our clients just can't seem to get through. And so it's the job, it's the child care, it's the housing. Thank you. Thank you. And we're running out of time. I wish we had a lot more time. Um, but I want to thank each and every one of you um, for the work that you do. You know, we partner um, with the Spain Human Relations Commission, partner with you guys, and we look forward to continue uh, working with you and um, referring people to your organization. Um, do we have time for um, Q&A? Uh, no, five minutes. Okay, we'll open the floor for any questions. Everybody. My name is Sharice Clemens. I am the executive director for Perfect Love Inc. Um, I want to employ all of you all who on the panel that actually work with um, people in domestic violence. Okay, my question is how do I improve my organization? Because I work with people with a low income mod as well as going through trials and tribulations concerning domestic violence and homelessness. Um, we had people with issues that they were living behind. Um, houses and cars and things like that. Um, what steps that I do I need to take in my community? I live in a distressed community. Um, most of the, um, the the funding comes from my son, and sometimes we reimburse with another. Um, um, we're compensated by another um, organization called Community Development Program. But um, we want to do more. Um, my desire has always been to open up my own um, woman shelter, um, but not just deal with women, with men also, because right now we do training with CDO training with the men in the low income, income mod that may not have housing or jobs, um, but we find them jobs thereafter. Um, we have been doing a lot in our community in um, Beaver County, but we want to do better. Can you please tell me what steps I need to take to be a better um, organization? Thank you.
people don't know is that VAWA 2022, when Congress reauthorized it, included additional protections for federally funded housing providers. So we can collaborate very specifically on matters, particularly where municipalities might have nuisance ordinances that are telling uh, survivors that they have to be evicted by their landlord because they call the police or EMS too much, as well as making sure that housing authorities and other subsidized housing providers are doing what they're supposed to do with emergency transfers um, and other model protections when they're